welcome on this day. This is the first plenary panel. Ah, uh, okay. The, here it's better, in this way? You hear? So this is the first plenary panel of this conference. And the keynote speaker of this panel is Donna Orange. We will be here uh, together in this plenary until 10, or maybe 10 past 10. And then all the rest of the program will happen. Is it okay? Do you hear me? So I, I will, I'm not the chair of the panel. We are equal. But as guest, I will introduce Donna Orange and then uh, Dan Bloom and then Lynn Jacobs and myself will comment on her speech to make a bridge between her thoughts, her theory, and, and principles of Gestalt therapy. So what I will do now is to introduce Donna Orange. She is educated in both philosophy and clinical psychology. She's an esteemed fellow of the Psychology and the Other Institute. So the, the title of this conference was very much inspired to her work, the aesthetic of the, the otherness. She's one of the initiator of this movement, the psychology and the other. Uh, there she provides workshops, mentorship, and is actively involved in the biannual conferences. She also, at the New York um, um, University postdoc, and she is also at, uh, at an Italian Institute of, uh, Sci of Relational Psychoanalysis, the ISIPSA, and she is also a trainer and a good friend of the institute that I direct, the Instituto di Gestalt, HCC Italy. Um, in New York, she teaches and supervises at, this, at, at the Institute of Psychoanalysis, Psychoanalytical Study and Subjectivity. She runs study groups in philosophy, in the history of psychoanalysis, and in contemporary relational psychoanalysis. She's author of many books, among which Emotional Understanding, Studies in Psychoanalytic Psychology, Thinking for Clinicians, Philosophical Resources for Contemporary Psychoanalysis and the Humanistic Psychotherapies, and then The, Th the Suffering Stranger, Hermeneutics for Everyday Clinical Practice with George Atwood and Robert Solorov. She has written, Working Intersubjectively. Uh, extending the reach of clinical theory. No, sorry, I mixed. Working Intersubjectively, Contextualism in, psychoanalytical, in Psychoanalytic Practice and words experience of experience, interweaving philosophical and clinical dimensions in psychoanalysis. And with Roger F Fry, Free. with Roger Free, she co-edited Beyond Postmodernism, Extending the Reach of Clinical Theory. Her philosophical studies include pragmatism, ethics, phenomenology, and many topics in the history of philosophy. In psychoanalysis, she wonder, wonders about the ways in which traumatic experience and fixed ideas, including especially her own, interact to inhibit dialogue and hospitality. So I'm sorry for my English. I hope you understood me. <laughs> and uh, this microphone is very strange. But did you hear my voice? OK. Uh, maybe my English was not so good, but uh, Hmm? Huh? Okay. 
Okay. So my now thank you, Donna, for having come here. We look forward to your words. Grazie. Grazie, Margarita. Um, uh, does the microphone work? You can? Okay. Um, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, soprattutto ai miei uh, cari colleghi italiano, uh, italiani che ci hanno invitati in questo posto bellissimo. <laughs> E bonjour, guten Morgen, meine liebe Kollegen und Kolleginnen, buenos dias, and hello everyone else whose language I do not speak. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great pleasure to see you and some of you to see again. It is also a great and humbling honor for a psychoanalyst, mamma mia, <laughs> to be asked to speak here. And I ask your pardon for repeating things that you know very well in your own traditions that we have in common. So to begin, my title is My Other's Keeper, Resources for the Ethical Turn in Psychotherapy. Are you tired? That would be an understatement most of us realize. Working with devastated patients convinced they are broken beyond repair, hopelessly unlovable, worthless and good for nothing, humiliated beyond inclusion in human community, working with massive social injustices and climate crisis as our daily context, working always to recover from our own traumatic histories, we may feel underwater like some underqualified mortgage. Non basta. It is not enough. I can't see my text if you do that. <laughs> they can't hear me in the back. Okay, I'll do. I'll do the best I can. Here, well, let's try this. <laughs> I have to see and. <laughs> okay. Um, please raise your hands up if you can't hear me, and I will try to do better. Okay, thank you. Here, if you're having trouble hearing. It is not enough. I am not enough. My previous efforts, Thinking for Clinicians and the Suffering Stranger, some of you know these books, made available some resources from my chief intellectual traditions, philosophy and psychoanalysis, for describing my psychotherapeutic sensibilities. These books attempted to show significant convergence between dialogic attitudes and radical post-Holocaust ethics with ethical turn trends emerging in recent psychoanalysis and in the humanistic psychotherapies, especially Gestalt. But these books left the struggling clinician, including their writer, in a painful gap between infinite responsibilities to the suffering others and the workers all too finite human capacities. Each book tried to answer an appeal from psychotherapist colleagues. The first, Thinking from, for Clinicians, responded to clinicians who asked for help reading philosophy, using its concepts and questions to help them read their theories. The suffering stranger answered those who for many years requested a book on hermeneutics the study of interpretation and understanding for those who work with the devastated, the study of an, for, with those whose suffering seems beyond meaning. 
It replaced the questions, what's wrong with you, and how can I fix you, with what are you suffering, and how can I accompany you. Now I have been faced with two more requests. Sometimes colleagues ask me to produce something more personal, even a memoir. A combination of personal reticence and ethical sincerity prevents me. I don't like to do this. My life is not about me, but for the other. And yet biography haunts us all. How much fate and how much choice brings us specifically to where we find ourselves today. Born a Roman Catholic from the Pacific Northwest in the United States, I took a radical turn in early midlife to New York, studied at Yeshiva University, and have since lived and worked in a mostly Jewish world. While embracing psychoanalytic culture, I also learned some German, intending to read philosophy and Freud, and married into a German-American family. While I have studied the German Lutherans' enthusiastic support for National Socialism, I have avoided looking much into the Catholics' complicity and energetic participation, probably worse. Similarly, I avoid biography and memoir, hoping to tackle the works of internalization, integration, and integrity through a life of service to the other, attempting to live wisely as my other's keeper. Many of you will recognize the phrase, my other's keeper, from Cain's insolent question to God, am I my brother's keeper? So the second query I cannot evade, what forms of responsibility plague all humanitarian workers, including clinicians, and how do we keep responding? What personal, spiritual, and communal resources nourish us as we try to keep responding and living humanly? Today, let us attempt, in as dialogic a spirit as possible, to consider this question but fair warning, we will find no general answers, instead ending with questions for each of us to engage. No formula emerges to fit each one's need. I encourage all of us to think as you listen to what I'm going to say about what your personal resources are of the kind that I'm going to talk about. How can anyone, clinician or humanitarian worker, continue to live an ethic that never allows us to say that we have done enough. Besides training or formation, serious, deep, non-dogmatic, dialogic, and non-abusive, that is, the kind I hope all of you have had and are giving to your younger colleagues, Besides profound personal desire rooted in a sense of vocation as well as in relational history, beyond the ongoing intellectual and supportive resources of our professional communities, what do we need to keep responding, to keep working with the devastated? Given our vulnerabilities to the emotional hazards of humanitarian work, Given our human exposure to illness and aging, given our personal and human limitations, given the isolating character of much ethical, humanitarian, and therapeutic work, how do we go on healing, teaching, and restoring dignity to others? How can the practice of philosophy in the ancient sense support an ethical turn in contemporary psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Clary Lise Katz explains that this turn, the ethical turn, to put the other first, needs to become the guiding condition of our lives. Philosopher and Talmudist Emmanuel Levinas, she goes on, describes this humility in terms of the one who has no time to turn back to self 
It is not a question of denying the self, as in an asceticism, for the self is not yet of concern. It is not a choice between me and the other, for that choice is not yet possible. Rather, the self is turned toward the other. That the self is turned toward the other. I believe the practicing clinician or humanitarian, also a practicing philosopher, can internalize the crucial resources needed to nourish and sustain the kind of practice that clinical work in the best of our traditions, including the ethical turn, requires. The needed capacities and attitudes involve not only wisdom and compassion, but also vulnerability and fallibilism, courage and humility. Given that we clinicians have human frailties, how are we to sustain the burdens, the loneliness, and the attacks? Let us attempt a partial response to this question. To avoid abstractions, my work has chosen exemplary, though more than imperfect, interlocutors. Instead of talking about philosophy in general, we spoke with Martin Buber, Hans Georg Gadamer, Merle, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and Emmanuel Levinas. To bring the hermeneutics of trust to life, we studied Chandler Fierency, D.W. Winnicott, Frieda from Reichman, Heinz Coet, and Bernard Brandschaft. These were in the earlier two books. Along the way, however, something more personal has occurred, something that my colleague Sandra Buchler calls writing of the psychoanalyst's experience of loneliness calls the use of an internal chorus. What she says clearly applies equally to my Gestalt colleagues. We psychoanalysts, by the way, use the term patient in its etymological sense to refer to one who suffers. That's the meaning of patient. In Buchler's view, Excuse me, one minute. Excuse me. <laughs> In Buechler's view, the internal chorus we bring into our offices every day must be of comfort and must be sufficiently stimulating to encourage the creative use of aloneness. The feeling the chorus must give us is that whatever may go on today with this particular patient does not define us as analysts or therapists. For we have already been defined and have defined ourselves through our analytic identifications and identity formation. We are not personally and professionally at stake with each new interaction with a patient. So my internal chorus keeps me stable and responding to the other, even when I feel besieged, persecuted, exhausted, or in Winnicott's words, in, a, in danger of retaliating. When we fail, as I have so often done, or when we lose a patient for reasons we only partially understand, my chorus helps me to resume my work with less self-recrimination than I could do without these voices. Similarly, humanitarian workers persist in the face of starvation, disease, and violence. We think, for only one example at this moment, of the many working long hours to help refugees and asylum seekers here in Europe and along our Mexican border. Buchler continues, with this foundation, we can experience aloneness with a patient as information rather than as judgment. We can turn the aloneness over in our minds, wonder what it is about, become curious about it, See it as meaningful, as something to understand, 
but not as an obstacle or as an indictment. An aloneness that doesn't cost us a good connection with ourselves, with our chorus, or with the patient can be used creatively. Uh, end of quote. My favorite philosophers and psychotherapists are all indispensable members of my internal chorus upon whom I can call when needed. They speak to me separately and together, both to reproach and warn me, like the daimon of Socrates, and like Sandra Buechler's supportive choristers, who remind me that my very being is not at stake in every session. My current songsters give me the further experience, not particularly comforting or comfortable, as of being enjoined as a reader. As Jonathan Lear writes, to the responsibilities Simon Critchley calls infinitely demanding. My choir also includes people whose names few would recognize, my best teachers who helped me to imagine that women could be leaders but never became names themselves, my training analyst and two early supervisors who believed in me long before I had any sense of my own capacities, many unpretentious craftspeople outside the clinical and humanitarian worlds who work hard and faithfully at whatever they do. Each of us assembles our nourishing resources in whatever way we can, through meditation, imitation, through various forms of spiritual journeying. For me, probably due to a discipline learned young in my convent years, my best path runs through a period of meditative reading pursued daily and early in the day before other concerns crowded out. Each of the authors who appears in this newer book, The Nourishing the Inner Lives uh, book, by the way, you can look at that out on one of the book tables. I, there aren't any for sale, but you can see it anyway. Each of the authors who appears in this book, and some of those in the previous two, can be read as objects of study, as dialogic interlocutors, and as spiritual guides. They help to form that inner ethical voice that Socrates called the daimon, keeping me prepared for the face and voice of the stranger to whom I am called to respond. Buechler appeals to the image of the long distance runner. In my younger years as a marathoner, I remember needing both to pace myself and also to find internal and external resources to keep me going. For me, the idea and reality of the internal chorus continue to develop. Some members recede into the background while others gain prominence and new voices arrive to inspire and challenge me. Even during the writing of the newest book, some shifts have occurred as I learned disappointing news of some figures I had long admired and came to know and treasure others even more. Some come from within my professional world and some come from a larger cultural sphere as they sus I suspect they do for psychotherapists and humanitarian workers of all persuasions. Recently, I have focused special attention on some chorus members from beyond my world of psychotherapy practiced in the psychoanalytic tradition. They come, in, they come into conversation with each other, often surprising me. They have become characters in my internal dialogue, as in a work of fiction. But I suspect that you who engage your own internal choruses in conversation will also find sustenance and revelations. Know thyself, admonished the ancient Greeks, to know more intimately those who influence us and whose voices support and nourish us, not only those whom psychoanalysts call the ever-present bad objects, we carry their voices too, of course, uh, can help to maintain the ethical response. Otherwise, our work simply becomes too hard and lonely. First, however, why is our work so lonely? And why do we need this help so much? 
Surely its traumatic origins make our work so demanding within the situation of a burning world. Relying on recent work on testimony and realization, it becomes clear why working with the seriously traumatized demands so much from the clinician, requiring such internal choral resources to be endlessly nourished and replenished. Without reviewing the scholarly and scientific trauma literature at length, we consider trauma, along with the condition of traumatism, it evokes in calling forth ethical response to make it clearer why such personal, communal, and spiritual resources become indispensable to clinical and humanitarian workers. So first, let me tell you a story. Some years ago, having encountered a disturbing error message on my computer, I called technical support. The competent helper, whose accent I recognized as coming from India, managed in a half hour or so to solve my problem. During a pause, I asked where he was located, and he named an area of southern India. Were you close to the tsunami, I asked. Oh, yes, but we are all safe here, and all my family too, some of whom were much more exposed. Thank you for asking. Then he began to repeat, almost sing-song style. It was so unexpected. We didn't expect it. It was so unexpected. We didn't expect it. We returned to our task, but as soon as there was another pause, the refrain returned. It was so unexpected. We didn't expect it. Thank you for asking. And so on. Even when our task was successfully completed, it was difficult to end the call. Let us assume that trauma is both event and experience. Something terrible has occurred, an earthquake, a rape, the death of a child, torture, genocide, a cancer diagnosis. Nothing can be as it was before, or can be trusted to be as we assumed it to be. One's world is just deranged. And even when gradually reorganized around the tornado's devastation or the dictator's dictates, this reality is always haunted by the sense that terrible things can happen at any moment. The psychoanalytic witness as my friend Warren Poland has so clearly and eloquently written, is the one who gets it, and thus allows the patient to get it, exactly as my question to the computer consultant released his own traumatic experience. Notable in Poland's description, and picked up in commentary by Al Margulies, comes a move from reacting to the patient to responding to an other. Margulies writes, in loosening the grip of a hermeneutics of suspicion, Poland is moving from trying to figure someone out toward trying to be with another. I would amend his formulation slightly, but perhaps importantly, Poland finds himself alongside the other. This may be the consequence of a more fundamental shift in attitude that he has already made. He often writes of working in service of the patient. The clinician, like other humanitarian workers, lives in a double asymmetry. From a surface point of view, we have all the power in the clinical relationship in most situations. From a surface, uh, we set the time, the place, the fee, and decide whether to see this troubled person or not. On the other side, once we are involved, we are besieged and persecuted by the face of the other, just as Emmanuel Levinas wrote. One expression he used for this condition of infinite responsibility when we are so finite was traumatism. Critchley explains that for Levinas, 
My relation to the other is not some benign benevolence, compassionate care, or respect for the other's autonomy, but the obsessive experience of a responsibility that persecutes me with its sheer weight. I'm sure we all recognize this feeling. The ethical demand, Critchley goes on, is a traumatic demand. It is something that comes from outside the subject from a heteronymous source, the other, which leaves imprint within the subject. The condition of the subject persecuted by pre-original responsibility, traumatism never ends. Levinas himself wrote, it is from subjectivity understood as a self from the dispossession of contraction dispossession, whereby the ego does not appear but immolates itself that the relationship with the other is possible as communication and transcendence. The Levinasian subject, far from an expansive or agentic ego, is subject is, sub, uh, is subjected more passive than all passivity, persecuted, taken hostage, this is terrible language. It finds itself responsible for the other in a pre-original traumatism. This subject's receptive capacity makes possible its relationship with the other as communication and transcendence before anything can be said. The subject is constituted as a subject in an original traumatism, traumatismo originel, as the subject of persecution and suffering. Someone asked me recently if my work intended to prevent vicarious trauma, traumatization. No, I said, not possible. We accept this traumatism, vicarious trauma, usually invoking, evoking our own history and thus a re-traumatization Vicarious trauma is re-traumatization for the sake of the other. Next, we consider the so-called ethical turn, a multidisciplinary phenomenon occurring in philosophy, psychotherapeutics, and beyond. The uses of this term have family resemblances, Wittgenstein might say. If anything, it's a refusal of Heidegger's turn because it is profoundly this-worldly. Most recently, I have been writing about the ethical as a response to climate injustice. Calling out my own countrymen and, and countrywomen, I have speculated that our largely unconscious history of settler colonialism and chattel slavery prevents us from hearing the cries of the poor we are destroying by our carbon and methane profligate way of life. We need the resources of the ethical right back to Socrates as the crucial domain of philosophy and ask whether a turn to the other may not also be foundational to psychotherapeutics. I'm going to ask how we're doing on the time. Are we okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> hmm? 20 more? Okay, I, we can do this. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of things here um, in the ethical turn, but I want to, uh, uh, t uh, let's see, what, what do I, I want to mention to you some of the most important people in my own internal chorus. Some, one, for example, is uh, Marcus Aurelius, Marco, uh, to, for you Italians, um, who reminds us every day that we live in the presence of our own death and uh, calls us to uh, live always in the service of the community. The, uh, then I, I, I write, and, and I, in the book that I particularly reference by the wonderful Frenchman, Pierre Adot, he encourages us to take a period of meditation every day 
He quotes George Friedemann, who says, to take flight every day, at least for a moment, which may be brief as long as it is intense. A spiritual exercise every day, either alone or in the company of someone who also wishes to better himself. Step out of duration. Try to get rid of your passions, vanities, and the itch for talk about your own name, which sometimes burns you like a chronic disease. Avoid backbiting. Get rid of pity and hatred. Love all free human beings. Become eternal by transcending yourself. This work on yourself is necessary. This ambition justified. Lots of people let themselves be wholly absorbed by militant politics and the preparation for social revolution. Rare, much more rare, are they who, in order to prepare for the revolution, are willing to make themselves worthy of it. And then the next, uh, person that I studied a lot and who has made an enormous impact on me is, is a young chemist from not so young later, from Torino, Primo Levi, who's witness from his life in Auschwitz, uh, I will come back to later in my story here. Other recent choristers have been Nelson Mandela and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, a Christian pastor who seems to have understood non-indifference. Non-indifference is a term for not allowing myself to become hard of heart against the other's suffering. Uh, non-indifference, it's an, a complicated term, but it's very important. Um, Nelson Mandela, of course, stayed in prison for 27 years and he could have become free much sooner if he had been willing to compromise the full equality of his people. And then there's Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky's Russia alongside Jewish texts and phenomenology formed the first of three great influences on the ethics of Emmanuel Levinas. I have now returned to the great masterpiece, the Brothers Karamazov, not in the depth that deserves, of course, but for some of what it contributes to my chorus. It is or this great novel is organized around Cain's infamous question. Of course, each clinician or humanitarian worker must find and assemble and sort out his or her own choir. No one can take mine. But for a related literary figure, one might choose Charles Dickens, Dostoevsky's favorite English novelist, for his similar ethical sensibilities or, and narrative capacities, or maybe Victor Hugo. But in each language you, uh, that you speak, you could probably find people who express your own ethical sensibilities that, and that you want to hold and cherish in your inner chorus. Having allowed these voices to converge in me in my 60s, I began my 70s with meditations on prophecy and on humility, in particular clinical humility. From the Hebrew prophets through many of the texts read here to the prophetic phenomenology of Levinas, I have been learning to understand clinical and humanitarian work as prophetic word in action. From such prophetic word once heard, there is no turning away, only attempting to hear better, to respond even before fully hearing. But because the call comes from infinity to finite me, Vulnerability and repeated failure require many kinds of, of humility, of surrender to fallibility, to aging, to the other. Authenticity, self-definition, my place in the sun become unimportant. Instead, unobtrusively comes a life lived for the other. You will already have noticed that this account has a more personal cast than the previous work. These choristers are my special people. They had serious flaws just as I do. Dostoevsky was a gambler and an anti-Semite. This did not keep Levinas from adoring his work. Bonhoeffer's attitudes toward women and marriage were masculinist, anti-Diluvian to my mind, 
And though he died for his efforts to interrupt the Holocaust, he still believed Jews were less evolved Christians. Mandela's personal courage and statesmanship outstripped his treatment of family reputedly. Levinas thought Europe was the center of the universe and made problematic use of gender concepts in his theorizing. Like these people, I have biases that only others can see. You can probably see them, in fact. Um, though I keep trying to see better by listening with my remaining ear and by reading my critics. My love for languages has probably attuned me to some members of my chorus, to Primo Levi's Italian, to Levinas's Merleau-Ponty's and Adeau's French, to the German of Freud, Gadamer, Wittgenstein, Bonhoeffer, Lovalden, and uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. Almost before I could speak English, I was hearing the church Latin still returns to me in Gregorian chant and in the music of Bach, who should have had a chapter in my last book. It has only recently struck me that the central and most stunning incident in Levy's book of testimony, Sequesto in Uomo, if this is a man, comes when his French companion in Auschwitz has asked him to teach him Italian, and Levy begins explaining Dante to him. A young Frenchman, Jean, known to the commando as the Piccolo, was designated to walk the hour's distance each day to get the soup at noon for the prisoners. For a few days, Levy, appointed to help him, took advantage of the chance for conversation and lighter work. Jean wanted to learn Italian, so Levy, having been required as a child to memorize much of Dante's Commedia, began one day to recite Canto 26 from the Inferno, the story of Odysseus's return home, explaining it in French and Italian to his young companion. Suddenly he dredged up the words, considerate la vostra semenza, fati non foste a vivere come brutti ma perseguir virtute e conoscenza. Think of your breed. You were not made to live like brutes, but to pursue excellence and knowledge. Levy writes, as if I was hearing it for the first time, like the blast of a trumpet, like the voice of God. For the, mo for the moment, I forget who I am and where I am. A few minutes later, he told us he was again nothing but a starving stomach. Avrei voluto raccontarvi questa storia in italiano. This stunning story could occupy us all day. My point here is that for me, languages and my fascination with them have been an ongoing internal resource. Languages link us not only to others, but to their very otherness. Studying languages constantly diminishes any remaining sense of my self-centrality. You will find other such nourishing reserves. My unifying theme is ethics, not the social contract ethics envisioning a plurality of independent individuals negotiating rights, duties, and properties but the radical pre-primordial ethics of infinite responsibility to the other person. Clinicians and humanitarian workers need internal and external support because their work demands courageous ethical response every day and never lets up. For an easier life, these would be irrelevant, a waste of time, or at least less indispensable. More than previously, my work now addresses younger and mid-journey clinicians from an aging view. To shift into my more familiar psychoanalytic language, it speaks of internalizing the voices and examples of those we need to hold us if we are to do this work over many years. It lets you know some of those whom in my later years I have deeply admired. All these people, I repeat, had major flaws. 
all bore sorrows. One died by suicide, one by hanging. Most spent extended time in prison or prison camps, and all suffered multiple and serious personal losses. Still, all managed to contribute something significant to human culture, and their voices have interwoven to support me in ways I would describe if time permitted. Most of them also rightly caused me significant discomfort. In particular, they charged me with the problem of my love for the riches of European culture, in particular German culture, the site of the most calculated massacre in recorded history of another people with whom I have also come to feel deeply identified. So my choristers support me and comfort me, but also keep me worried. My mentors do not impose on me, as one thinks in considering clinical humility, the obligation of surviving in a particular way, or even of surviving. Indeed, pulling them together has itself been a humbling experience, learning both that I had undervalued some who have influenced me and overvalued others. As Simon Critchley writes, the fabrication of a book is like the growth of a cancer. What an image. Where a, a cell departs from its usual metabolism, connecting with and infecting other cells interconnecting to form the sentences on a page. This dark metaphor describes for me the gradual emergence of a complex ethical accusation, infection, and persecution you will find interwoven in the pages of that book. A syndrome I could not see when I set out. What I do hear clearly from all my choristers is the responsibility to live for the other, not for myself. Ironically, their very insistent conviction sustains me. Though Sandra Buechler's internal chorus inspires this work, those whom I read for sustenance do not always comfort, as Franz Kafka wrote to his friend Oscar Pollock. Listen to Kafka. I think we ought to read only books that bite and sting us. If the book we are reading doesn't shake us away like a blow on the skull, why bother reading it in the first place? What we need are books that hit us like almost painful misfortune, like the death of someone we loved more than we love ourselves, that make us feel as though we had been banished to the woods far from any human presence, like a suicide. A book must be the axe for the frozen sea within us. He writes like a psychoanalyst, I'm sorry. Though my aesthetic is less austere than Kafka's, and yours may be too, you will find some resources, yours and mine, more challenging than comforting, but still I hope sustaining to your ethical core. Above all, I hope to start a conversation among younger colleagues about your own intellectual, cultural, and spiritual resources. In addition to one's early teachers, in addition to bodily care, hobbies, family, and well-nourished friendship, uh, friendships, in addition to continuing professional growth, each clinician, I believe, needs to find personal inner voices over time, living and dead people who inspire and admonish and hold in times of trouble. This chorus will change over time as influences fade and new ones step up, but it must not be neglected. Mine provides examples that have become important to me in my later years, though some have endured a long time. Those discussed here are not the formative voices. Many of those were the significant women of my years in education and academics. Others function as what Baroque musicians call continuo, or ground bass. They accompany all my internal conversation. Examples of these include Socrates, who argued that it is better to suffer than to do evil, and that death does not threaten a good human being. And no matter what religious people have made of him, the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, preaching blessed are the poor, those who mourn, and those who suffer persecution for justice sake. This very conversation, however, might become a resource beyond the usual shop talk, whether clinical or theoretical, that stocks our conferences. We might even become choristers for each other. Thank you.
Okay. I will. My name is Dan Bloom. I'm a Gestalt therapist from New York City. I'm a fellow of the New York Institute for Gestalt Therapy. I have to touch the mic. I have to almost swallow the mic. My name is Dan Bloom. I'm a Gestalt therapist from New York City. I'm a fellow of the New York Institute for Gestalt Therapy. I'm not used to introducing myself with one sentence. Hearing Donna speak, I'm once again moved by her powerful humility and the rich content of what she said. And I've, I'm inclined to take what I've written and throw it away. As I'm now re I now remember how difficult it was to respond to the fullness of what she said. But I, I will. And I apologize for my English. <laughs> I'm always embarrassed that I speak English, and only English. And when people speak their language, they speak English to me as a, as a second or third language. I'm not only embarrassed, but I have so much respect for the effort you're making. Donna asks, excuse me, what, what, what forms of responsibility plague all humanitarian workers? And how do we keep responding? What human, spiritual, and communal resources nourish us as we try to keep responding and living humanly? And then she asks us through these questions from her own perspectives as a Gestalt-friendly psychoanalyst, philosophically oriented, into, I skipped because I have 10 minutes. Donna's talk still resonates. Our conference theme directs, us, directs our attention towards the aesthetic of otherness and to meeting the boundary in a desensitized world. So let's pay attention to us right now. You, I, we are actually others to one another. I'm speaking American English, New York English, fast English, for which I ask you to let me know. My words announce my otherness. My presence announces my otherness. We gather as two organizations, other to one another, in culture, in norms, with different expectations, coming together for the first time in this conference. We're here from many different countries. There are so many people here, and so many of you don't know each other. So many of you know each other. And we're Gestalt therapists, all different kinds of Gestalt therapists. Donna is an intersubjective psychoanalyst. She speaks English. Sometimes she speaks psychoanalyse. <laughs> and sometimes she speaks Levinasian. Donna characteristically holds her theory lightly and uses abstractions with the lightest of all possible touches. And I forgot to tell you, I study philosophy with Donna. I know her. She's a friend, a colleague, and one of the dearest people I know. In these and uncountable other ways, this is a gathering of others. As other, see, when I cut things, this is what happens. Let me just go to the next paragraph. So what is your experience? As I listened to Donna speak, so much felt right to me. Wow. I experienced the warm hum of familiarity. As I say, Donna is my friend, colleague, teacher. I also noticed I bumped up against differences, sort of caught my breath when I heard something I wondered about, or think I disagreed with, or separated me from what she said but never from my heart. Familiar and different, comfortable and uncomfortable, peaceful and uneasy. These are the rhythms of an aesthetic of contacting the other, without which contacting would be a process that fades into the mists of confluence, confusion, and misunderstanding. As Gestalt therapists, we know that contacting is contacting some other, 
some not me. And the other is always disturbing, different. It is so tempting to close ourselves off from the other, yet we know the value of staying in the bumpy process of the full spectrum of the sensations of the aesthetic of the other. From the purring pleasures of comfort to the annoying discomfort of confusion, this is recognizing similarities and being open to difference. It was easy to recognize in her message the importance of support for ourselves in our work. And perhaps you translated this for yourselves as a necessity for support for contacting. How essential it is for each of us to be grounded by our communities, our colleagues, our families, personal backgrounds, and process groups. Donna's chorus sings a music for her that we each must find for ourselves and use in our own work. Such a chorus is placed within the ground, in the figure ground of our professional competence that organizes and nourishes our personal availability is different for each of us, but our human need is essentially the same. Our own commitment to the non-hierarchical intrinsic values of contacting showed up in Donna's discussion of what she referred to as the hermeneutics of trust. These are easy to recognize, I think, and easy to link to our Gestalt therapy. And we felt along with Donna as she described her, su her support of her work in working with devastated patients, humiliated beyond inclusion in the human community, social injustices. For as Gestalt therapists, we are implicitly drawn to the suffering of others in the larger social field. Since, paraphrasing Pearl Sefferlein and Goodman, and I have to do it, New York Institute, no one, could completely, no, no one can be completely happy until there is general happiness. The relational turn, ethical turn, we all heard these words in Gestalt therapy. Now I want to turn to Donna Levinas and Gestalt therapy. Maybe this is one of the aspects of Donna's talk you found difficult to follow. Maybe. Maybe. Gestalt therapists are more familiar with the, with the more accessible language of Buber inclusion, dialogue, mutuality. So I'll wonder along with you if Levinasian ethics has a place in Gestalt therapy. And I'll try to do a little translation of Levinas and then see if I can apply it to Gestalt therapy. Donna introduces Levinasian, her Levinasian orientation. My unifying theme is the radical pre-primordial ethics of infinite responsibility to the other. Right? Easy. To think of pre-primordial as before, before everything is even easier. In this ethics, we are besieged and persecuted by the other. Now, Levinas is, is, takes, takes no prisoners. I want you to know that. His God is Yahweh. Yahweh is, has thunder. Remember that one. Our relationship to the other is not some benign or benevolent respect for the other's autonomy, but the experience of responsibility that persecutes. In Levinasian terms, I am taken hostage by the other. I am a subject, subjected, an ethical subject, more guilty than anyone. Now, Donna's clinical brilliance is that she takes this Levinasian mouthful and offers us smaller bites. She makes this specifically relevant to clinical practice and concrete being in the world. Uh, with mischief using a Heideggerian term, by the way. In terms of therapy relationship, we are presented by the other's suffering and, and our guilt takes the shape of our willingness to go along with the other's suffering. Besieged by the other's trauma, we are re-traumatized so that the therapy relationship is a transcendence, a crossing over from an as if one person stance to a communication from a one to the other. And that's an understatement communication. A one-person psychology cannot be, it has never been. Here I am, a subject. I and the other do not stand one to the other. I'm not that far from the end. I and the other do not stand on even ground, but on an asymmetrical landscape of height. You, the other, are above me. This is what is called the curvature of intersubjective space. This is not the mutuality of a Buberian connection. Donna makes clear, no, this is not surrender. Since I, therapists, do not capitulate, 
but I'm willing to accompany the patient other. Let me see if I can weave this into Gestalt therapy. After the ethical turn, we paid attention to the structure of the therapy relationship. Therapeutic contacting could no longer be a solitary process of the patient, but co-emergence of the contact boundary of the therapist and patient. The therapist is co-involved in the figure of suffering of the patient, and this involvement is experienced in the aesthetic of contacting, shaping the therapy. I got the red card, <laughs> the dreaded red card. What about the suffering other? <laughs> and they say they're the suffering other. Now that's a Levinasian problem. Okay, let me go, maybe race to the end. Because hostage, okay. I will race to the end, okay. I promise, racing. This is me racing. Okay, I really am. Okay, this is it. Uh, as therapists, with our presence and clinical expertise, we shepherd the emergence of the figure of the other suffering and taken hostage by the propulsive intensity of contacting. We're taken hostage. It's a feeling of, inter of contact. When we're engrossed in contacting, we, 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 are, we are drawn along, and we don't disappear in passivity. It's the, it's the sound and suffering of the patient that takes us hostage. We no longer are chosen. We continue as active agents taken hostage by the suffering of the patients, the suffering of the contact boundary, which insists, persists, and persecutes. And we never, we, never, we, never, huh, we never lose a sense of who we are because we willingly choose to participate in the therapy. We do not disappear. We intervene, suggest being alive with the patient. So it seems to me Levinas may have something to say to Gestalt therapy but infinite responsibility, guilty for all others, while well, I draw my line, and I'm forced to draw this line. Thank you, Donna, and thank you all. My name is Lynn Jacobs. English is my first language. I appreciate the grace and courage of those of you who are willing to listen in a language that's not your first language, and to those who are presenting in English when, lang when that is not your first language. Oh, I'm the co-founder of the Pacific Gestalt Institute, and I'm also a psychoanalyst. I'm gratified to be able to spend a bit of time, let me know if you can't hear, giving some of my associations to Donna's paper. She's a dear friend, colleague, and a friend to Gestalt therapy, and I'm very pleased that she is here. I'm drawn to two main themes from Donna's paper, a paper that cannot help but inspire reflection on what matters to us in our intimate involvement with the experiential worlds of others, which in my case means patients, whom we often come to love and hate, and we also cry for them and cry with them. We come to celebrate for and with them, and they are people for whom we ultimately grieve or perhaps breathe a sigh of weary relief or both when they leave us. Here are the two themes I am drawn to. One is an emphasis that Donna provides, and the other is a useful question. The emphasis is on the inescapable ethics of our engagement with our world, in this case, hu interhuman engagement. And the question is, what supports each of us to embrace the maelstrom, the heartbreak, the suffering, and the loneliness that haunts our encounters with those who seek help from us. The emphasis and the question are intertwined, of course, in that supports are what foster our ethic of engagement. For me, the ethic can be stated as a dialogical attitude. I have taken my inspiration, as did Laura Pearls to some extent, from Martin Buber's philosophy in which he describes such things as surrender to what emerges between us, 
he, sa- he describes a full body turning towards the other, and he refers to courting surprise, welcoming surprise. The attitude calls us to include the otherness of the other as fully as possible while being present to the other, a kind of porous, vulnerable nakedness. It calls on us to recognize that while we practice inclusion and stand revealed in our presence, we are humbled in the poignant yet expansive awareness that my understanding, my recognition of this other before me is inescapably incomplete. This person before me is always more than I can know of him, her, or they. And my knowing of myself has become itself slippery and fluid, like a soft assembly. So this form of contacting risks our very sense of who we are, risks our very sense of self. And yet as we move along, it is also felt as our fullest sense of ourselves. When we talk the language of field theory, we speak of ourselves as emergent. The emergent processes of a dialogic form of contacting embody an ethic that we value because such contacting supports presence, free-flowing awareness, and the ability to respond flexibly. In other words, creative adjusting. And this is where the theme of the ethics of our dialogic contacting and the question of supports intertwine. Two of the supports for the risk we take in dialogue are what attracted me to Gestalt therapy in the first place. They both are examples of the aesthetics of Gestalt therapy. The first is that I was drawn to the nuances of therapeutic conversation. And I need to say here, when I use the words conversation or dialogue, I am speaking of an embodied being with. I'm not restricting this being with to the spoken word. At any rate, When I talk about dialogue, I'm talking about a particular relaxed postural shift, the right word said in the right way, or a small gesture made at a particular moment in the flow of conversation, which could be offered by either the therapist or the patient. These can be health-affirming or evocative, just the thing that needs to happen to keep the dialogic contacting going, or to restore a broken down dialogue. I know that for many people, their first acquaintance with Gestalt therapy was a form of grand activity and show. But my first acquaintance was with the subtle musical, dance-like aesthetics of being together. The experience of truth-telling in such a situation is a sensory experience that one feels in the muscles of one's face, in one's breathing, in the expansion of one's diaphragm, in one's growing freedom of movement in the moment. Therapeutic conversation, even when profound suffering enshrouds us, has a beauty that transcends the pain without obliterating the pain. So what first drew me to Gestalt therapy was the beauty of meaningful dialogue, which always, of course, means an other, as all contacting does. The being with, and it remains one of my strongest supports for putting my heart at risk. The second, which is an aspect of the dialogic attitude, is the Gestalt therapy emphasis on presence. Joseph Zinka wrote a lovely essay in the first year of the publication of the Gestalt Review entitled, Presence as Evocative Power in Therapy. His description made clear how the ethic and aesthetic of presence were intertwined. As with what I was saying about the surrender to dialogue, to a conversation that takes us somewhere where we didn't necessarily intend, Zinker says of presence that it stimulates unknown parts of oneself, parts not yet fully sensed, 
described or named as awarenesses. He said, another's presence makes me feel my own being here, my own validity. Presence is generally empowering. He describes qualities of presence in sensate terms, deep, full, and even breathing, a sense of being grounded, diffuse attentiveness, readiness to respond, something like Friedlander's zero point. Sitting with someone's presence, as Zinker writes, I feel free to express myself, to be myself. I would add, to find myself and find the other. To reveal any tender, vulnerable parts and to trust that I will be received without judgment or evaluation. Being in the presence of presence is, I dare say, miraculous. My professional interests have been shaped by a long and blessedly successful struggle to overcome a pervasive sense of isolation and emotional disconnection in my life. And in fact, my initial and current attraction to the world of Gestalt therapy is that the experience of the therapist's presence offered some hope for salvation from my own emotional impoverishment and isolation. Thus, my daily experience of finding my way to presence with another consoles me at times. It certainly enlivens me. It is a most profound aesthetic experience that, while risking myself, also saves me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my comment is the last. Um, Donna's approach has an immediate impact today. We work with people who are devastated. And this is particularly appropriate in our world and in, in this land in particular, which hosts thousands of migrants. They arrive here traumatized by political persecutions and tortures. They find in Sicily the stepping stone to Europe, who in this moment is called to host this human wave, which reaches us with fullness of pain, but also hope. And more generally, we are called to change our therapeutic intervention and adjust it to the feeling of emergency and loss of ground that is everywhere. So why we Gestalt therapists want to dialogue with Donna Orange? Donna is a psychoanalyst. And Gestalt therapy distanced itself from psychoanalysis at its birth. But recently, both methods have developed towards phenomenology and aesthetics and have reached similar positions in certain respects. And this is particularly true for intersubjective and relational psychoanalysis, who have this focused on the interactive movements between clients and therapists, including the contribution of the therapist with a field perspective. Donna Orange stands against the authoritarian position that the clinician may take, in line with what has been called the ethical turn in psychoanalysis. As Gestalt therapists, we might think being authoritarian is something about psychoanalysts, not about Gestalt therapists. But allow me to disagree. Even a Gestalt therapist can be authoritarian if he or she doesn't overcome the narcissistic culture. Actually, it's the culture in which Gestalt therapy was born 
that needs to be rethought, even from us, Gestalt therapists. Donna applies Levinas' concept of ethical responsibility towards the other to clinicians. And this allows her to develop a new humani humanity of the therapeutic encounter with the terrible awareness of the possibilities of good and evil. evil. It's a new way to see evil. Every human being is free, and he or she can frustrate us. Being human implies the freedom to do evil, not only good, even if we do not intentionally want to. So we are fallible, we can do the evil. Just think to the ethical and clinical consequences of this statement. And it's just this ontological being fallible that allows us to be responsible in a new way out of the narcissistic mode that requires us to always be great and able to take care and make the good. It, all it allows us to take a human, humble and realistic responsibility which doesn't detach from the other and doesn't require a separation between the good and the bad, the ideal self and the real self, the good therapist or mother or teacher or whatever, and the guilty healer. The ethical turn represented by Donna's thought switches the clinical problem of the client and the spiritual problem of the therapist from the relationship with oneself and her his capacity of a strong ego to the relationship towards the other who is there even when we don't want, challenging our total self. We cannot split in front of the other. Donna says, Be being humble is not shaming. It's compassion to ourselves and acceptance of our limits. In my opinion, Donna has been able to finally overcome the narcissistic culture, which is based on the split between one's own responsibility and fragility. We feel more radically involved with our fragility. A narcissistic mode could be, I'm responsible while I'm in session. I can be another person when I'm, not, when I'm out of my role. Donna reminds us that we cannot get rid from the whole presence of the other. We are what and how we are. We are never perfect and we fail in front of the other. But today, Donna has posed a further step. What do we need to keep responding, to keep working with the devastated? I like to connect Donna's speech to a couple of points that are relevant to the growth of Gestalt therapy. And we could translate her question in Gestalt terms in this way. How can I support you? How can I see the beauty that is still in your suffering and keeps you alive? So the first point I would like to underline is the switch from the humanistic values to relational and aesthetic values which is necessary today. It's not much, how can I support you to get rid of imposing social rules and find your autonomy and creativity? It's not that anymore, but it's how can I find the life and harmony that is still there in spite of your suffering? The clinical value is changed in Gestalt therapy. And the clients, our clients, don't need to be freed from social impositions, but they need to find themselves in contact. The aesthetic relational knowledge, as I call it, is our tool to support the intentioned harmony in the suffering other. Through my senses, I can resonate with the other, offering the missing ground to create vivid figures. If I say, for instance, I feel alone when you say that as a therapist, 
It's not to offer an obvious feeling that the client has disowned, but to let a field emerge from the other side of the moon of the client's experience, which is the therapist's aesthetic feeling. Donna focuses on the most difficult part of our experience of this. How can we leave an ethic that never allows us to say that we have gone, done enough? If there is, there is not a goal to be achieved, but a presence to fulfill, can we accept that we are not perfect? And so the second point uh, uh, the, of my comment is, today, overcoming dichotomies implies to consider the unitary nature of self-other. <coughs> it implies to consider the field. The other is indissolubly part of our life. In Gestalt therapy terms, we speak of the unitary nature of organism environment. The other is the different, and together with us, she makes a unit. The more we feel the difference from the other, the more we create the contact boundary, the more we grow in a given field. So we have to die to our ego, as Peirce himself said, to be able to be with the other. In more modern language, we wonder, in front of a borderline experience of the client, for instance, how am I contributing to his ambivalence and not letting himself go? Or when the client tells us a dream, we wonder how have we contributed to the client's telling of the dream, not the dream itself, but the telling, which is the contact, make, the contact that the client is making via that dream. So the unitary perspective makes a change in the use of the empty chair and all the Gestalt techniques. And the third point I want to say about Donna's speech is that the contact is the normal condition of human experience or of the self. The point for us is not if there is contact, but how we are in contact. Our ethic is to support what is already working in contact making, not to reach a different mode. I give you an example with a borderline experience, which I always give, I like this example. The client says to the therapist, I will never trust you anymore, you have lied to me. And this, uh, the, the client says this after that he has called the therapist at midnight and the therapist has not answered. And the therapist answers, I appreciate the dignity by which you say that. So it, it, the therapist does enter into the content, but appreciated the aesthetic of how the client says that. We don't want to change the client's mode. We stay with it and support the good energy, the harmonic addressing to the other, which is the way the client has used to creatively adjust while keeping the interest for the other. Donna reminds us the special ethics of fallibilism, always curious, humble, and spontaneous. It's the same attitude that a researcher has while she takes seriously every novelty she feels while in contact with the client or the situation, since the aim is not to find the truth but to go on, discovering always a new truth, contextualized in the situation. I thank Donna for her revolutionary thoughts, for her, and for being a live example of this attitude of care and research. It's a good start to take our curiosities and questions seriously in a deeply human and non-evaluative way. I'm sure that in that attitude lies the source of research and of the advancement of any science and the novelty for our therapeutic approach. Thank you. <laughs>